about uh, diagnoses of the hip and then I'm going to point to perhaps some uh, examination tips uh, which you can find on the web. Um, so without further ado, this is the hip. Um, basically what we're going to do is revise the hip anatomy. Uh, we're going to be aware of some common and not so common hip or groin pathologies and also to be aware of some hip and groin tests like we talked about. Um, this is a hilarious short video uh, which won't go but it's a million ways to die in the west and a very funny film um, and basically it's a little thing about science and how we've got to use science to try and approach something like the hip um, and then again this is a video that's uh, not going to show but it's uh, an injured player sort of jamming his hip up and getting probably a hip label tear so hip and groin pain is the fourth most common injury in the soccer players. It's the third most common in the AFL, around 10% of all injuries. And hip and groin pain um, is the third most common reason to time loss to injury from, from hip. So you've got hip fractures, you've got joint reconstructions, and then the sort of nebulous concept of joint pain um, or groin pain, uh, and then other injuries. Just for trivia pursuits knowledge, adductor longus is the most common adductor injured, just in case you think it's an adductor strain. And of interest, the word groin most likely originates from the ancient English word brind, which means abyss or void, um, which is a little bit comical because the sports medicine view of the groin is it's a little bit like the black hole of sports medicine. There's so many anatomical structures in and around the groin or anterior hip that can cause pain. Um, that's why it's so problematic to try and nail down the actual cause. And just of interest, when playing the same sport, males had greater injury incidence of groin injury than females. Um, so may, you may see a few more blokes in your clinic with it. Um, types of hip pain we'll go through is anterior hip pain or groin pain. Um, and again, if you're interested in it, the terminology about groin pain sort of got nailed down for describing different types of groin pain uh, in a Doha 2014 consensus statement. And if you're not that interested, who cares? Um, lateral hip pain or greater trochanteric pain syndrome, which is the latest term, and posterior hip pain, um, which often comes from lumbar facet joint pain, SI joint pathology, or and or this idea of deep gluteal space syndrome which includes piriformis syndrome um, as one of the causes of this deep gluteal space syndrome. So just revising the anatomy of the anterior hip, um, in the front, in the yellow, we've got the uh, pubic symphysis, uh, a joint with a, uh, a hyaline um, cartilage separating it. There's no synovial, it's not a synovial joint, a uh, very strong joint, particularly inferiorly and anteriorly with its ligaments holding it in place. Um, the inguinal canal and the conjoint tendon medially, so the inguinal canal just lateral uh, and diagonal to the pubic symphysis. And the conjoint tendon is the uh, meeting of the external obliques and the rectus abdominis fascia. So that forms a, a thick tendon just on the medial um, side of the superficial ring of the inguinal canal, so that can be torn as well. Um, and then You've got iliopsoas related pain, so all these are relating to potential causes of pain. So you've got pubic symphysis pain, inguinal canal pain, and conjoint tendon because it's sort of the one entity. Iliopsoas related pain, so the main hip flexor in green. We've got the adductor related and blue adductor related pain, and hip joint pain, which is in behind uh, the iliopsoas tendon there on the left of the picture. So the pubic or pubic symphysis related pain, um, one of the benefits of the sort of Doha sort of chat about to nailing the terminology down is they did talk about sort of useful tests to try and sort of um, prove where this groin pain is coming from. So local tenderness of the pubic symphysis and immediately adjacent was probably the biggest test for pubic symphysis pain. Um, and there's no particular test that specifically provokes symptoms. You might see um, the other test that's talked about is the squeeze test where you lie on your back supine with your knees, uh, hip flex and knees at 90 and the, the fist placed between the knees and the knees squeeze. That's the squeeze test um, and that's talked about in groin um, circles uh, as if that provokes pubic pain. It's another sign for pubic symphysis pain but 
or osteitis pubis. So that's really what we're talking about here, osteitis pubis pain. Um, but mainly it's that local tenderness over the pubis um, that gives it away. Um, another term that was sort of bandied about for this pubic symphysis pain was uh, pubic shear stress or shear, yeah, stress, shear stress syndrome. And I think it's a good way to think about it because the, the, the thought is that the origin of the pain around that pubic symphysis comes from an imbalance of forces from all the things that attach onto the pelvis around it. So you can have tight adductors that might cause it, uh, tight iliopsoas, tight rectus, uh, glutes. So anything that forms that core, the core stability, um, or adds to the core stability of the pelvis, if it's weak or tight, that could cause an imbalance of forces on the two halves of the pelvis. And it's the smallest part of the pelvis, and obviously you can get some uh, forces, shear forces being distributed through it. So um, I think we talked about on the night uh, that I gave with the Acupuncture Society uh, College uh, is that there's a, an x-ray called the stalk x-ray. They have a one-legged x-ray, one foot in the air. And sometimes the that pubic symphysis is so broken uh, just from these forces going through it that you can actually see a, a subtle subluxation of, of that joint. Um, so that it can be very painful. Uh, then inguinal related groin pain. Um, and that, again, it's a palpation test, so pain location in the inguinal canal and tenderness. Um, so they point there and you feel it gently and it's tender. Um, the key thing, I guess, which is different to a traditional inguinal hernia is that there's no palpable hernia present. Remember to test for it with them standing um, and then, uh, then lying down, but standing is more likely to give you that typical inguinal hernia bulge. Um, and what you can do with that to provoke it is get them to do a sit-up or a crunch um, on the table, examination table, and in fact causes that pain because that valsalvering effect. And the thought is there might be some posterior wall weakness to the inguinal canal, and that bulges forward, push it, putting pressure on the uh, nerves that sort of go through the inguinal canal, uh, and that can cause pain. So you can do the sit-up test and palpate it. That's inguinal-related groin pain. Iliopsoas related groin pain. So the iliopsoas is a combination, obviously, of the iliacus and psoas, um, and that attaches onto the lesser trochanter. It's the main hip flexor. So you got iliopsoas tenderness, um, and so if you do resisted hip flexion um, and or stretching of the hip flexors, um, the Thomas test or the modified Thomas, um, that can cause pain. So um, that's a thing. So Iliopsoas, when you see the physios really dig in there, it's quite a, a deep muscle. So pushing quite hard on the lateral wall of the pelvis and the iliac fossa very laterally will put some pressure through the iliacus. Um, and that can be tender at the best of times, but it's especially tender on the affected side. But I think that stretching test is, is a very effective test for that. Um, Adductor-related groin pain. Um, it's tenderness over the adductors and pain on resisted adduction testing. So I usually, you know, carefully palpate up from the belly of the adductor. So usually adductor longus, um, which is the main muscle belly that you'll see sticking up at you when the, the legs uh, sort of AB ducted and, and um, flexed out with a little bit of hip flexion. Um, and you palpate all the way from the muscle belly, musculotendinous junction, and onto the bone. Um, so you can get an enthesitis uh, where it attaches onto the bone muscular tendinous tear and muscle belly tear. So those, and then that's similar for all muscles and tendons. Is it the insertion, even origin, but insertion, muscular tendinous junction or muscle belly. Um, so palpate your way uh, along it. That's a good one. In adduction testing, you can test it again with the legs straight um, or legs slightly abducted with your knees straight or again like the squeeze test for the pubic symphysis pain. You can bring the hip hips up flexed, knees flexed at 90, and squeeze uh, with your fist between the knees to see if that creates adductor pain. So all these tests, a little bit like the neurological testing, always put the muscle in a position uh, of strength and then test it. Hip-related or joint-related groin pain, so osteoarthritis and FAI stands for femoroacetabular impingement. Um, so that's, uh, that's possible. So uh, again, that Typical OA of the hip pain causes, you know, groin pain, um, and uh, 
the other condition which can happen in a younger age group, traditionally though it can coexist with the older age group with osteoarthritis, um, is this idea of uh, where the, the perfect ball of the femoral head is sometimes more egg shaped, and that's the cam type impingement. So that egg doesn't sit perfectly within that uh, spherical um, acetabulum, and it bumps against usually the anterior superior part of the acetabulum and can damage the labrum. So the other, that's a cam impingement, and so you can also get a pincer where the acetabulum might be overgrown or there might be a big osteophyte there that's sort of digging into the uh, femoral head. So often there'll be clicking, clunking, locking, um, and that's that FADER test, F-A-D-I-R, flexion, adduction, and an internal rotation test. And it's like a quadrant or a scouring test where then you put it in that position and circumduct it around, and often there'll be a reproduction of that groin pain. Of interest, when if you do that test and then they start putting laterally, that's often uh, a sign that it's more gluteus medius or minimus problems. It's not a not a joint pain. So if they go, oh, you know, when you put them into that fader test, you can and say, well, where's it hurting? So ask them where it's hurting. If it's a groin, it's a hip joint. So that could be the iliopsoas bursa. That's the only other thing that can get pinched. So iliopsoas bursitis or intra-articular pathology. You know, such as a synovitis, chondral damage like an osteoarthritis, or maybe you're getting an impingement like a cam or a pincer type impingement. But it gives you that hint there's something in the joint that's that's an issue. So that gives you ideas about what sort of things you might want to do for imaging, or you might want to then send it on to an orthopedic surgeon or a sports doctor to, to have a look at. So just revising some of those anterior hip pain things. So you've got label tears, so that's that cam or pincer. Uh, type problems that can cause femoroacetabular impingement or FAI and just while I think of it those label tears they think do encourage osteoarthritis in later life so they are worthwhile treating whether it's conservatively or operatively um, and everyone usually gives it a good go conservatively so they use by good go I mean about three months or so of conservative strengthening type physiotherapy in the, around the hip Osteoarthritis of the hip joint, synovitis, so that might be reactive to uh, like a uh, erty or a flu type uh, irritable hip, particularly in the young ones, 10 year old boys with irritable hips, or synovitis related to the osteoarthritis. And hopefully not a synovitis related to an inflammatory or a infective, I should say, cause. So I think of a septic hip, you're not going to see it necessarily because it's a very deep joint, it's not going to bulge. Uh, ligamentum teres, tear, so that's a ligament that attaches uh, from the middle of the acetabulum to the fovea or, or the central part of the, of the head and there's probably some proprioceptive fibres in it but you can tear it, um, particularly in hyperlax individuals like gymnasts and dancers. Uh, hip joint instability, so the hip joint itself, again it's a joint issue, might rock and roll in the acetabulum against with the hypermobile uh, patients. And if you don't know how, it might be worthwhile revising how you check for hyperlaxity in your, in your patients. So that's a Beitman scale, I think I'm pronouncing it right, B-E-I-G-H-T-M-A-N scale. So it's out of nine, um, you can look it up on the, on the web. Um, so if they four or score four or five out of nine, they're probably hyperlax and, and have some collagen laxity. If that's the case, I always get them to see an ophthalmologist to check their retina to make sure their retina is healthy. Um, they can also dislocate their lens. And the ophthalmologist can actually look in the lens and, and there's some pattern mnemonic uh, changes or, or cataract or lens disorders that they can see on slip lamp that uh, might hint to what type of collagen uh, disorder they have. So it's worthwhile doing. Um, and also send them off for an echocardiogram to look at the aortic root. So you don't want the aorta root to dilate, potentially causing aneurysm later in life or aortic root dilatation causing aortic regurgitation. So you might want to have a listen to the chest um, just to make sure there's not a, uh, a you know, rip-roaring murmur um, needing urgent echocardiogram. And then you've got those other things. So all those things are, relate to hip joint, obviously, and then you've got all those other groin-related pains. So you've got iliopsoas, inguinal canal, and pubis, the bone pain, or the adductor pain. Less commonly, but sometimes you see it as stress fractures. Um, I've usually seen them in the in runners, usually women, 
usually on a restricted calorie diet or they're binge exercising. Um, so whether they've got an eating disorder or in current sports medicine language, it's uh, REDS, Relative Energy Deficiency Syndrome. Uh, pubic ramus and acetabulum. Uh, we've seen fractures through the acetabulum with uh, bikers. Uh, you know, push bike, fall off. I can get um, uh, you know fractures through the pelvis. And if they're non-displaced, might walk into your my. Uh, I've only had one, I think, and then he walked into the room with an acetabular fracture. Um, so don't be put off if they walk in. Um, and we've all seen non-displaced neck of femur fractures that that have walked in. Uh, traction apophysitis. So the Apophis uh, is that part where, of the bone where in the growing teenager the, the in tendon inserts. So you've got Severs disease in the back of the ankle, you've got Osgood slatters in the, in the tibial tubercle, um, but you can also get ones with rectus femoris insertion on the AISIS, and the ASIS is where Sartorius comes off. Um, the iliac, uh, the ilium is where the external obliques insert onto. So you can get tr attraction apophysitis in the growing teenager in all those places. So uh, ultrasound is very good for showing that up. Nerve entrapments, again, very good nerve. Uh, ultrasound can usually show those up quite nicely. Um, and referred pain, um, less commonly, but remember sort of the anterior hip or the groin, sort of S, um, L1, L2 sort of area. And, and SI, joint, SI joint pathology, really. Um, avascular necrosis of the head of femur or otherwise called spontaneous osteonecrosis of the femur you can get that also of the uh, knee so it can suddenly get very painful and basically just the bone dies off MRI, wonderful to pick that up synovitis of the, of the hip like don't miss a septic arthritis it might be the first onset of rheumatoid um, in the 13 year old boys a slipped capital upper ephemeral epiphysis um, so just a plain x-ray will show that nicely, Perth's, Perthes disease, um, so again it's an osteonecrosis of the head of the, uh, of the femoral head um, in the young ones, so classically the three to five year old boy, and they might present with a limp, non-weight bearing, if they're very young they can't you know, talk and describe it very well, but as you're playing with them internally rotate the, the hip and they really yelp, and they might even grab their knee, remembering that, um, that the hip often refers to the medial knee. Uh, tumors, of course, we've got to always think of those. And intra-abdominal pathology is a is one to think about. Um, I've seen two ovarian tumors that have presented as hip pain, um, but feeling up into the iliac fossa, you know, just above um, the hip joint, is you know, doing an abdominal examination is important, uh, and not missing those medical um, diagnoses: appendicitis, kidney stones, and diverticulitis, and left iliac fossa. Uh, a badly uh, formatted because it went through to um, sorry my Gmail and then downloaded, uh, but just just for these segmental acupuncture ideas um, about where iliacus and psoas and rectus femoris and sartorius are, um, and just a, a nice little chart of the dermatomes on the left and cutaneous nerves on the right. So dermatomes looking at sort of L1 T12 that that's sort of the groin area. But what I really like with this Netta's um, picture on the left is those areas that he's highlighted in purple, L3, L4, L5, are uh, a lot more consistent areas on, on the lower limb where it's more reliable testing for those dermatomes because there's a huge amount of overlap with the dermatomes. So if you're going to um, you know, do an examination, those are better areas to try and sort of find paresthesias or... Um, even hyperalgesias, you know, those sort of nerve issues. Um, and the cutaneous nerves, just worthwhile thinking about those only because of nerve entrapments. So if the pattern of pain is a bit weird and doesn't fit a dermatome, is it, does it fit into a cutaneous nerve? So um, that uh, seatbelt injury or the tight genes, um, that can cause impinging of the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve of the thigh. And a little bit more lateral to that um, is the iliohypogastric nerve. So um, that's worthwhile thinking about, and again, medial to that is genitofemoral femoral nerve. So the ultrasound people can usually sort of trace these nerves out and see if there's swelling or inflammation, edema, sort of around the, where the nerves pass through the fascia. And while they're there, you might go, you know, plus and minus ultrasound guided cortisone over where those um, neurovascular bundles come through the fascia. So um, the usually the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve of the thighs medial um, to the ASIS by a centimetre, 
and then just inferior to that by a centimetre, so you can palpate around that. If it's tender, um, that could be an impingement. And just some myotomes, and again, it's, it's probably more, again, for that segmental acupuncture idea that um, if you work, work out what myotome is being affected or painful, maybe you can needle that. So around to the lateral hip, um, causes the hip pain up to 20% of uh, hip pains presenting uh, to primary care. So it's very common, particularly in the middle-aged uh, and older women. Um, and the lateral hip pain or greater trochanteric pain syndrome um, is, is usually due to gluteus medius or minimus plus or minus either one with or without coexisting bursal pathology. So this is a key point. The bursa will be inflamed every time, 100% of the time, um, because of a tendon underneath it being grumpy. So this is where the cortisones don't work very well. So you do a cortisone into the bursa, it settles it down, um, and then temporarily maybe, and then it flares again. So they're back again with this lateral hip pain. It's because the tendon underneath hasn't been addressed. It hasn't been strengthened, um, and it hasn't been the pain, you know, the nociceptors in it are still firing. So really, really worthwhile to get them to a physio to address all that um, deficiencies and strength, get a strengthening program and when you think about needling um, then you're needling sort of muscles that or needling the, the muscles are she points maybe or the uh, segmental innovation um, whether it's a myotome or over the dermatomes um, so they present with this lateral hip pain um, that's localized to the greater trochanter tra so for sure they'll jump when you push it but also sort of take the time to push just above it and behind it because the glute minimus um, you know, is quite vertical, that attaches onto the anterior facet of the greater trochanter, and the posterior lateral facet is, is where the glute min, uh, medius attaches onto. So, um, so it's worthwhile trying to palpate those up. So, the glute medius is quite quite a vertical, a uh, minimus, sorry, is quite a, a vertical muscle, and uh, glute medius uh, is a little bit more oblique. Um, so one, you know, one thing they always say is they can't lie on it at night. It's very painful. If they don't have a, a pillow between their legs and they stretch it, it's painful. Um, and one question, you know, they can't. If you got hip arthritis, it's very hard to bend over and um, basically do a, a Faber flexion abduction external rotation, which is a move really to put your shocks, socks and shoes on, um, and that's that can stir the joint up. It's not specific to the joint, but it's it's. If that causes the anterior groin pain, that's that's a useful to differentiate it from that more lateral pain, which is difficult to lie on. And if they go up and down hills, the ITB often compresses it because that gets stretched when you flex your hip and flex your knee. It compresses those tendons uh, that are damaged onto the greater trochanter, causes pain. So deep palpation, so you palpate it, direct palpation, the jump off the bed, and don't thank you usually. Um, a uh, clever test is a single leg stance test. We you stand on the ipsilateral leg, so I stand on the leg that's sore, and just on one leg, and you might have one finger on the wall just to sort of prop themselves up so they don't fall over, uh, and see if they can last 30 seconds. And usually through that time, they'll get more and more sore. And you might even so see them do a Trendelenburg. They go from neutral perhaps to a Trendelenburg positive, um, as, as they stand, because their, their hip abductors, their glute medius and minimus just can't tolerate it. Uh, you can stretch their leg while they're lying, uh, so you can bring it into abduction, adduction, and that will stretch it and that'll hurt it. And Ober's test, if you're not too sure of that, um, you can look it up on, online. Um, and Trendelenburg gait, so remember Trendelenburg sign, when they stand on the affected leg, the contralateral hip should be higher because the AB ductors on the affected ipsilateral leg are contracting and bringing that pelvis up. And if they're not quite up to the task, they'll relax or they, not, they won't fire and the contralateral side will drop down. And that's a Trendelenburg positive saying that the, uh, the glute medius and minimus are a bit sad. So lateral hip pain, just a summary, so glute minimus or medius tears, tendinopathy, occasionally maybe referred pain from the lumbar spine and a coexistent bursitis. And again, you can't sort of forget about tumours and whether they're, they're bony tumours or soft tissue tumours. Uh, nerve root compression, more often the iliohypogastric nerve that sort of goes over that lateral surface. Um, and I just wanted to point out, this is a screenshot of my anatomy um, thing I've got on my iPad. 
uh, glute minimus is pointed to because it's quite a vertical muscle. And then you've got sort of just behind it glute medius if you're trying to palpate it out, just, just for interest. Um, posterior hip pain can be a bit of a, a, a dog's breakfast and hard to sort out. Usually, most of the time, it's pain, referred facet joint pain from the lumbar spine, but it can occasionally be, and well, also commonly, hamstring tendinopathy where it attaches onto the ischial tuberosity or sacroiliac joint dysfunction. So less commonly, these other things are there. Um, so it's just a table for the sake of um, a complete table uh, or fairly complete. The only other thing that's fairly common is this ischiofemoral impingement on the less common side and piriformis syndrome. So ischiofemoral impingement, which you may not have heard about before, is where the quadratus femoris, which sits on the lateral side of the inferior pubic ramus, that attaches onto the lesser trochanter. So you imagine on your old skeleton, that little gap between the pubic ramus on the inferior side of it and the medial side of the, fe of the femur, where the lesser trochanter is, that little gap's filled in by quadratus femoris. So if that's inf inflamed and sore, that or there's a, a natural narrowing of that bony width where it should be fairly wide, that can pinch the quadratus femoris and cause this pain. So again, you'll see that on sometimes on ultrasound, uh, and you'll see it on MRI, for sure. Um, so these are all other things that aren't piriformis syndrome, but includes piriformis. So that is, this goes into that deep luteal space syndrome. So these are basically impingement type things where uh, and a hamstring, so you get fibrous bands that can cross the sciatic nerve. Uh, you got true piriformis syndrome, where the sciatic nerve, instead of going underneath it, which it does in about seventy percent of the time in normal people, uh, as in you know everyone with, with or without pain, um, and the other thirty percent of people it can divide into two, and part of it can go through piriformis or above piriformis, uh, above and below it, you know all sorts of variations, and get pinched by piriformis. Um, all these sort of tiny internal uh, hip muscles, the gemelli, inferior superior gemelli, and the obturator internus between them, they again they can entrap the sciatic nerve. The sciatic nerve might have an aberrant course through them. Uh, we talked about the issue of femoral pathology and hamstring conditions. So you, often you can get a story out if if it's tethering the sciatic nerve of a bad hamstring tear. It can perhaps even rip, you know, maybe ripped off the bone or a partial tear. And the scar tissue can grab the cytic nerve and then pin it down onto the bone. So they should be able to see that on ultrasound and dynamic ultrasound imaging. So the cytic nerve usually moves about 28 millimeters or almost three, three centimeters when the knees are uh, flexed and the hip flexed. Um, and they can see that normal gliding in the cytic nerve. If it's not gliding properly, um, then you can hydrodissect it out or put some cortisone around it uh, under ultrasound. So those are some pictures just showing some of those variations of where the sciatic nerve comes out through the uh, piriformis, which is labelled P, uh, superior glomeruli is in G, sciatic nerve is the big yellow thing uh, for interest. And when, when you come to the hip examination, just think about the things you can poke or palpate and the things that you can't poke or can't palpate. So things you can palpate or poke is the sartorius, so its origin, the ASIS, you can feel the rectus femoris, so you can feel its origin at the AAAS. Again, like all tendons and muscles, you can feel the enthesis. You can feel the musculotendinous junction, and you can feel into the muscle belly. Just follow it down. Uh, glute medius and minimus tendinopathy. You can feel around the corner on the on the trochanter. The adductor and th enthesis, the adductor musculotendinous junction or belly. Um, and usually you're feeling your ductor longus. So those, those are some things. And some other things you can do, do an intra-abdominal examination. So make sure you feel the true pelvis and the abdominal, abdomen, um, inguinal hernia, tenderness, the sit-up test, and you can palpate the uh, pubis. Things you can't test for, but this is why there's other special tests, hip, hip joint pathology, such as osteoarthritis or labral tears or the sign of itis. Femoral, femoral neck stress fractures, uh, that's hard to pick up um, because you obviously you won't see it on x-ray because by definition it's a stress fracture. So the bone on MRI will be edematous and you may see a cortical crack or you might not. Just for interest, if it's on the, the uh, top surface, that's considered um, a bit of a surgical emergency because that's a, a traction or a distraction fracture. So that fracture could come across and complete the, across that neck of femur.
Um, so you put them immediately on crutches, non-weight bearing, and see an orthopedic surgeon urgently. On the undersurface, on the inferior part of the neck of femur, that's, a, that's been compressed, so it hasn't got such a danger of being um, uh, of, of fracturing all through the neck of femur, but worthwhile talking to a sports doctor or orthopedic surgeon for it management. Uh, Iliopsoas strain and bursitis, so we talked about the fader test and then the stretch test, modified Thomas or Thomas test, and the femoral uh, shaft stress fracture, So, and that's a fulcrum test. So again, those things that you're not sure we you can't palpate and not want to know how you test for them, then you're looking up the FADER test, F-A-D-I-R, for hip joint pathology. Femoral neck stress fracture, that's a tough one. Uh, that's where you need imaging, but you're suspecting it in your runners and people who look very light, uh, lightweight. Uh, Iliopsoas strain, you're doing the stretch test for that, see if it's sore. Again, femoral shaft stress fractures is a tough one. Again, it's at those runners. I think doing over 35 kilometers per week is a risk factor. So if you're doing sort of 40, 50, 60 k's a week, you look quite uh, thin, maybe they're not eating enough, you get a good dietary history out of them, then you're thinking about these uh, stress fractures and you're getting an MRI. So when we go through the hip examination, um, you'll be looking at them, observing them walking, remembering 10 steps, or just so you know, 10 steps is considered a minimum for the uh, amount of gait that you should watch before you you can safely assume it's a fairly normal gait for them. Um, are they Trindallenberg? Is it antalgic? Is it, are they circumducting their hip around? Um, and we talked about sometimes the reason for that is might be leg length discrepancies or the hip's so stiff they've got to push it around. Commonly the uh, quadriceps muscles pretty atrophied and they're using their glute medius and minimus to actually circumduct the hip and eventually they wear out so they have to throw their hip around the corner to get it in front of them. Uh, lumbar spine, flexion, extension, rotation, compression. So we're checking the lumbar spine, flexion for disc issues, extension for facet joint problems as a general statement. Active movements of the hip, flexion, extension, resisted internal and external rotation. So when I do it, usually I get people to flex the hip up actively and then I'll passively just push it just a little bit past where their end of range is to feel if it's a bony hardness. So that might be a bony block like osteoarthritis or a soft tissue block um, and then internal and external rotation so um, I often do that passively and internal rotation is the money you know with fader again if you've got hip joint pathology internal rotation of the hip really stirs it up and they point to the groin because it hurts um, so you've got your passive movements but like I said often I combine them with your active movements then you palpate, you know, so you do a tummy examination, you feel the pubis, conjoint tendon, remember that medial part of the inguinal canal, you feel the inguinal canal itself, you feel the adductors, uh, and then while they're on their back, uh, I'll be doing that sit up, and then get them to the end of the bed and do the hip stretch to test the iliopsoas, and then I'll get them back up to the bed, and then if they need a sideline, then I'll lie them on their side and feel the greater trochanter. Um, while they're on their back, that's a good time to actually feel the ischial tuberosities too. So that's to see if there's any hamstring tendinosis. Um, and a hamstring test is, is actually lying on their back with their leg on your shoulder, pushing into the bed, and that tests their hamstring. Um, femoral percussion or fulcrum test, have a look up on the videos. Side lying, if they're getting the side, then you're feeling the greater trochanter, the gluteus medius and minimus. Uh, Ober's test, you can see, look at that on the videos and resisted abduction, so they separate their legs and you try and push down, and that's a test for the glute medius. Uh, prone, lying on their front, so they're feeling their lumbar spine, uh, and the small nerves across the iliac crest called your super, uh, superior cluneals. Palpate the sacroiliac joint, and the glute max origin, and all the trigger points, um, and, and trigger points which are in, in the book. So I hope that uh, gives you some ideas, and I think from a video point of view, um, the best thing is have a look at the British Journal of Sports Medicine uh, on the YouTube channel, BJSM, and uh, there's a guy, Professor Hutchinson, I think he goes through <clears throat> all the joints, um, but you know, obviously we're looking at the hip today, so look look at how he approaches the hip and, and does a hip, hip exam, uh, and feel free to visit me at the clinic, at Wakefield Sports Clinic, anytime, and I hope you've uh, enjoyed this bit of a chat about the hips, and... Um, have a great rest of the day and rest of the week and 
sure we'll see you soon. Thank you very much.